I heard you guys talking before class, and I heard you guys use a word I didn't know what it meant. Something like extra credit? <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've never, I don't know what that term means. <laughs> Talk about accounting. Okay. Um, all right. We're going to do three things today, I think. First thing we're going to do is we're going to look at um, the last dice game example um, just to pick up a couple of different things. Then I'm going to ask you um, what in the class uh, are you most confused about? And then we'll hopefully get some answers. Or maybe hopefully we won't get any answers. Maybe everyone knows everything. That would be great. Um, but we'll try to get some answers there. And uh, then we'll start talking about the project. All right? So the one that I picked, the last dice example that we're going to go over is the one that's listed as five dice here. All right. We also will look briefly at Ren Zeller's Rana truck too, just for the heck of it. Um, so we'll look at that one too. All right. Now in this iteration, a couple things have changed, and let's look at them. First of all, I have two custom classes. I have a die class, and I have a high-low gain class. I did this so that the dice could be reused on other applications, as could the rules for the high-low game. Keep in mind that the high-low game is not the only dice game you could possibly play. If this website was Zeller's dice games, you know, they all might use dice, but the high-low game might just be just one of them. Or it could be a mini game incorporated into a bigger game or something like that. So because of that, I have separated my code even further. And I've put the rules for the game in a separate class. That will allow me to use it anywhere I want to. So let's look at the on click button here. And the on click button We'll run it to show you what happens. Oh, you know what happens. I mean, visually, it's the same as it always has been, but just to review. We make our choice. We click the button. It tells us whether we won or lost. Now, what's different is in the code behind. Notice how clean the code behind becomes. All right. The button roll event has almost nothing in it. All it does is gathers the user input and calls the appropriate functions. So, for example, I Create the high-low game object. This contains the rules of the high-low game. I grab the user's choice from the drop-down list. I call the high-low game play function, which returns a true or false. The true indicates if the user has won. Uh, a false indicates if the user has lost. I then look and... display the label. Finally, I set the image URLs to the image URL um, that I get from the game. All right. This is very, very, very clean code. There's no game logic or what would sometimes be called business logic in this um, user event to click on the button. And that's a good thing. All the logic that is related to the game or it could be to the business process or whatever is located in a custom class. So all of this
this code is going to do is be the glue between my user interface, which is all the things on the screen that the user interacts with, and the actual business rules, which are built within the custom class. All right? So, we create the new object. We call the play function. We display the images. So let's look at the high-low game class. The high-low game class now has the two dice in it. All right? The user interface doesn't even have to play with the dice. All right? The user interface asks the game for its dice. So the game is sort of the driving force here. If I play, what do I do? I take my two dice. I roll them. All right? We saw the roll function last time. It gives us a random value. I told them together. I look at the user's choice to see if they've won or lost, and then I return a boolean that says if they've won or lost. All right. Notice this is not tied to the user interface at all. The user choice comes across as a number, zero, one, or two, I think. No, I'm sorry, one, two, or three. All right. No, I was right the first time. Zero, one, and two. And the rules for whether they have won or not is contained entirely in this function. And all this function does is returns a true. So in other words, I could give you, I could give a, a, a programmer, um, if I didn't have the ASPX page, I could give the programmer this class and they wouldn't even have, need to know how to play the game. They would just need to know what functions to call and what to give it and how to get the, the names of the dice. So all they need to know is the names of these functions. To play the game, you give the user's choice, 0, 1, or 2. You're going to get back a Boolean. That says whether they won or lost. All right? Now you have to know the rules of the game. All you have to do is call the function. Likewise, you don't have to know how to get, how to name the dice, or where the images are stored, or anything like that. You just need to do uh, call this function. All right? So we've removed even more of the code. Last time, if you remember, when we looked at that example, whatever that last time was, the code for the dice was in its own class, but the code for the game was still part of the click event, which meant, again, by implication, that it could only be called as part of that page and could only be called associated with the button clicking. All right? This, however, sort of abstracts that code, puts it in its own class so we can reuse this code elsewhere. And I did it with game logic here, but you could do it for any sort of logic that's related to your problem domain. So a business rule, a calculation for calculating shipping costs is a classic one that I always say, just because that can be very complicated. Or a rule to calculate um, a, an employee's uh, pay, or anything like that. That could be put in its own class, and then it can be called from anywhere. All right? Questions about this? I then went and I created the start of a Yahtzee game. All right? I didn't play this all the way through, but it really wouldn't be that much farther to go to play this all the way through. And I did this to demonstrate um, that... Um, once you have set these things separated into classes, um, then writing code that's reusable becomes a lot easier. So let's look at how the five dice game works. Set that to start page and run this. All right. I roll the dice initially. I get the five dice, and I get a little checkbox next to them. If you know, if you remember how Yahtzee's played, you roll five dice, you can then pick which dice you want to keep and which dice you want to re-roll. Um, your goal is to create certain combinations, like, for example, five of a kind is one combination. Um, a straight, where they all go in sequence, like two, three, four, five, six, is another one. A small straight, where you just go three, four, five, six, is another one, and so on. Uh, three of a kind. Uh, two pairs, you know, you go for these combinations. It's kind of like poker? Kind of like poker, right, in, in that you can keep and get rid of some and you're going for certain combinations. Now, I forgot how I wrote this. I think a check means I want to re-roll it. So I'm going to 
keep the, the 6, 5, 3, and 4, I'm going to try to roll a 2. All right, because that would give me 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I got a 6, and one more roll, I got a 6 again. This is a good Yahtzee game because it lets me keep rolling until I get what I want. There we go. We got a winner. All right. So this is, like I said, is just the start of this. What we would have to do to get this to work is, number one, only limit them to three rolls. And number two, create a, a class like my high-low class that had the rules of the games of Yahtzee. So let's look at the code for this. It's really not that earth-shattering. But it is a good example how we can reuse the dice class in at least the start of the game. All right, we have our five images. Excuse me. We declare our dice. I tried to implement the, the maximum number of rolls, but I didn't seem to get that working. And if it's checked, I roll the dice, and I display the image. If it's not checked, I don't roll the, the dice. Now I can make this cleaner, because the first time you always want to roll all five dices. You don't even need to check the, 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 the box. And after the third time, then you can't roll again. You'd have to start a new, a new round. All right? And the, uh, the uh, dicing object would... Um, would um, or the, the game object would then score it. So those would be the changes that I'd have to make on the user interface side. All right. Um, number one, I would have to uh, always roll the dice the first time. Always roll all five of the dice the first time. The second thing I would have to do is only limit them to three rolls. All right. I would then have to write a scoring uh, application. And again, Depending on how far I want to take it, we could score a whole game of Yahtzee. Like, once you get three sixes, you can't get that again. So it doesn't count for anything. You'd have to score it a different way. Um, but in its simplest form, we could score it and tell the user what they got on that. All right? And, and forget about any previous rolls. We could just say how many you got for this roll. That would be the simplest version. All we would need then would be a class like the high-low game. We would do just about the same thing. We would move the day, uh, the, the five dice objects into the high-low game. When we would roll, we would send to that function five booleans saying, do I want to re-roll this dice or not? The first time you rolled, uh, they would all be true. Each subsequent time, they would be controlled by the checkbox. You'd only let them roll three times. All right? And then finally, after the third roll, this gaming object would look and score that. It already has all five of the dices as part of the uh, object, so it would simply look and, and figure out um, the scoring based on the rules of Yahtzee. So we're not, wouldn't be terribly far from writing a simple Yahtzee game. We have a good part of the user interface done, and a good reason for that is that we've taken and we've abstracted the code of the dice out of that. This would be something if you'd want to play with and see what you could come up with, that would, that would be cool. To see if you could go and take this and complete this and at least score a round of Yahtzee. All right, you wouldn't necessarily have to try to score uh, a complete game, but a round. All right, let's look at our next, next example, the Zellers Rena truck.
notice again, I'm going into the folder that contains the web config file. I still get occasionally people turning in the wrong files. All right. What you want to do is wherever your code is, you will see the web config file and you will see all your pages. All right. That is the code that I want you to turn in. Okay. All right. Actually, I don't think this example is the one I thought it was. So we'll probably just skip this one. This still has the code built in for the calculation of the um, the calculation of the um, how much it costs to, to rent a truck. Studio. 
and this assumes that I have a, you know, like a U-Haul business, and I'm renting trucks, and this is calculating the bills. All right, so this assumes that if you have a small truck, it's twenty dollars a day. If you have a medium truck, it's thirty dollars a day. If you have a large truck, it's forty dollars a day, and you're also charged seventy-five cents per mile. All right, so let's run this and let's see the results. Start date. Let's say I ran at 9-1-2017 and return at 9-3-2017. I ask for your email address, interestingly enough. As for the number of miles, let's say I went 400 miles, and let's say I had a medium truck. And then I calculate the bill. And the bill is $390. So I had um, one, two, three days. Actually, four days. Because if I ran it well, let's see, 4 times that is 120, uh, 3 days, 100, so that would be 90 for that, and 75, uh, three, uh, 75 cents times my 400 miles, that would be 300, so that would be 390, is that what I got? Yes, 390, so 3 days. Uh, the way the calculation works, it includes today as one day. So if I rented it today and brought it back today, uh, that would be one day. And if I rented it today and brought it back tomorrow, that would be two days. If I rented it today and I brought it back uh, the day after, it would be three days. So the first to the third is three days. One, two, three. So that's three times 30 is 90. 400 times 75 is 300, so 390. So the calculation is correct. All right, the calculation is correct, but again, this code is built as part of the button, which means that it can only be executed when I click this button. It's the only place I can do that, and that's what's wrong about this. All right, I want the flexibility to maybe be able to call this from other places. All right, just to give an example, I could have on my website an estimator for you to estimate how much your uh, rental is going to cost. So you're thinking of renting a truck, you could put in, well, I plan to have it for three days and I plan on, uh, you know, going 200 miles, how much is it going to be? And I plan on renting a large truck. Boom, it will give you an estimate for that. All right. I might want the same calculation when the person actually checks out, right, when they actually have rented it and they're bringing it back. I might want that calculation as part of that page. So I could easily have this calculation in a couple different places. Right? I could have it as an estimator to say this is the estimate, you know, assuming these things are right, this is how much you're going to pay for your rental. And I could have the same code when they actually go and check out to tell them uh, how much they owed. All right? So I would want this in more than one place, and right now the way it is written, it only lives as associated with this button click event. So it only lives on this page. So we want to make a custom class for it. All right, let's think about what we want in the custom class. All right, um, the custom class, we could do this a couple different ways. All right, um, we could create a rental class. Do this, I'm going, to, I'm going to describe two different ways that we could do this, and we'll do the simpler of the two, all right, as to not confuse. I could have a attribute for size of the truck. I could have an attribute for the number of miles. 
I can have an attribute for the starting day, an attribute for the ending day, and then finally I could have a function to calculate the cost. I would then write functions to set the size, the miles, the days. I could create a, use a constructor to create those if you're familiar with creating constructors or so on. I'm going to take a little bit of a shortcut. I'm going to forget about these attributes. And I'm simply going to put in my calculate cost method, I'm going to put four arguments. Or, yeah, four arguments. Start day. An end day, the size of the truck, and the number of miles. These are going to be dates. Strictly speaking, they're going to be date times. All right. Size is going to be an integer. I have the convention that I think zero is, or, or what is it? What is the size? The size actually is not an integer, it's a string. S, M, and L, small, medium, and large. Then I have the number of miles, which I have defined as an, as a double. And this is going to return a double. So this is sort of what the signature of my function is going to look like. So what I'm going to do is in here, I'm going to go up and say file, new, file, and I'm going to pick class. I'm going to give it a meaningful name. message that says that the best place for these to be in is in a folder called the app underscore code folder. Do I want to put it there? Sure. Might as well. So I'm going to say yes. So it will create that rental class in the folder. All right. And now I'm going to go and I'm going to create my function. It's going to be public. It's going to return a double. I can actually just copy and paste this. And there's my function. Usually, by convention, I will put an arg at the start of the arguments to a function. That's just sort of my convention. You don't have to do that, but in my mind, it helps me to know what is an argument and what isn't. Yeah. All right. So, now I'm going to take the logic, and the logic I've already written, I'm just going to copy it. And I'm going to revise it, though. So it doesn't take the values from the form. It takes the values from the arguments. In doing this is to make code that's going to work with different user interfaces. The user interface to do my estimate of how much your cost is going to be to rent a truck 
is going to be different than the user interface when someone actually checks out. All right? There could be radio buttons instead of drop downs, or there could be whatever. All right? So the user interface is going to be different. All right? Um, so the goal here is to write the code that doesn't look at the user interface at all, but the right code where all the values come in as arguments. So, this calculation is to simply take the start day and subtract from it the ending day. I think I said that reverse. The ending day and subtract the start day. Now, one thing about days in, in uh, C sharp, uh, dates rather, they're actually date times. All right? So if you think about it, any point in time is a date time. If I were to say now, it would be 10.47 a.m. on September, whatever day it is, 26th, all right, or something like that. Okay. September 26th is also a time. It's just a less precise time. So a date time really, a time is really, a point in time is really a date and, and a time combined together. I can do date arithmetic and say this date time minus at date time, and it'll tell me the difference between the two. So I don't have to write complicated functions to do that. I can just say this date time minus that date time. But I have to say what I want it expressed in, right? Uh, do I want it to know it to the minute? What's the difference? Do I want to know to the day? Do I want to know to the hour? All right? So in this case, I'm interested in the number of days. So I take the difference of the date and time, and I subtract days from it. Or, or I, I subtract the start date from the end date, and I express the answer in terms of number of days. Then I add 1. All right? I add 1 because if they rent it today and return it today, they get charged for one day. If I just did the subtraction and they rented it today and returned it today, the difference would be zero days, and I would charge them for zero days. Well, I'm always going to charge them for one day. Likewise, if they rented it today and brought it back tomorrow, they get charged for two days. All right? So that's why I add one to that. I then have my cost. All right. Comes in as an argument. So I don't have to do this conversion. RB size, I'm not using RB size, I'm using the argument of size. So if arg size equals s. Arg size equals m. Arg size equals l. Then the rate is $40. The total price then is the rate times the number of days, number of days is calculated here, times the number of miles. That came in as an argument. times 0.75. Now, because this is a function, I have to return that value to whoever called it. So this function, you give everything the function needs to do the calculation. To calculate how much we're going to charge for this rental, we need to know the starting and ending day, we need to know the number of miles, we need to know the size of the car or the truck that we're running. Yes. To do the calculation, you take those pieces, ingredients, do the math on them, do the comparisons and all that, and come up with an answer. 
that answer, you have to return to whoever asked the question. All right? And again, when we're done with this, the code for the user interface is going to be very small, right? Because the work is done in this object and or in this class. And we can reuse that anywhere that we want to. All right? We don't have to duplicate the effort. So if the rule changes, if we change it to a dollar a mile, or if we change the rates or whatever, we could only have to we only have to make that change in one place. So now we have a class that does the calculate cost example or calculation. Now I just have to make the GUI work with it. Right. So I'm going to keep this code here because I might be able to use it to do some copying and pasting. So I have to create an instance of that class. Rental R equals new rental. That's how I create an instance of this class. Double cost equals R dot calculate cost. That's the function. I have to give the first date, which I get from the text box. Second date, which I get from the text box. The size, which I get from the selected value of the RB. And then finally, the number of miles, which I get from the text box called miles. should give me the same answer. If we were testing this, how many test cases would we run? Would we be celebrating right now because this gave me the right answer? No. What should we do at least? Well, we should at least teach, uh, test a small, medium, and large truck, right? Because we know the cost depends on the size of the truck. We should test with different miles to make sure that the miles are properly handled in there. And we should also do kind of what uh, are like, like called edge calculations, 
Like, for example, what if they only ran it one day? Let's make sure that calculation worked right. So that if they only, if they brought it, if they rented it today and brought it back today, they should get charged $30 for the truck plus 75, uh, I'm sorry, 300 for the miles. So that should be $330. That should be. And that's what it is. All right. So in, in a lot of programming examples, you have like things that like lie right at the edge of uh, a condition that requires like a, a different calculation, like a boundary in an if statement, for example, or something like this, where one day we want to make sure that that's handled properly. Another example would be uh, overtime calculation. You should do it for just exactly 40 hours and make sure that that works right. And also do it for slightly above 40 hours, 41 hours or 40 and a half hours or something like that to make sure that that calculation works the way it's supposed to. Then again, we have three different uh, categories of, of that, uh, of car or truck. So we'd want to test each one of those. We'd want to test with different mileages. We'd want to test with different date ranges. Might want to test with a date range that goes over a month. So what if they had it for... That would be 31 days, and I'm assuming that that number's right. Um, we can do the calculation in our in our head to figure it out, but I think it's right. So it'd be 31 days at $30. It'd be 960. Plus 300. That'd be 930 plus 300. That would be 1230. So yeah, they did do the calculation right. Okay. So did that answer your question? Or is there still something that you're not clear on? Or? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Anyone else have a question? Or an area that they're not so sure about? Going once, going twice, sold. All right. Here's what the class is going to be for the rest of the term. This is like week five, so we're about a third of the way in the class. Today we're going to talk about the project. And after we talk about the project, we're going to do, we're going to talk about designing user interfaces for collections of pages, in other words, for sites as opposed to individual pages. So far, when we've created our ASPX pages, we've pretty much just created each page as, as like, uh, each of our assignments has been like one pagers, right? So we didn't really worry too much about like the overall design of our site. Um, but we're going to talk about our project now, so we're going to sort of expand our scope and start thinking about um, larger websites that include multiple pages. So after we talk about and define the project, at a certain point in time, probably even today, we'll start talking about some of the things that are built into ASP.NET that allow us to do um, a good job creating um, an overall consistent appearance on our site. All right? So that's what we'll do um, next. After we've done that, which will take a lecture or two, we're going to get into database stuff. And that's where we'll stay probably for most of the rest of the class. All right, this is web database integration. What we've talked about so far in this class has been sort of on the ASP.NET side of what ASP.NET is, what components are available, how you can write some code, how the C-sharp works with the user interface, and so on down the line. Um, our next step then is to bring the database components into it because that's where the fun really starts and that's where the power really starts. All right, let's look at your assignment, your project, that is.
project introduction. This is so weird how it's resizing it. Very weird. I think what's going on is the page is resizing it and the layout of the page is changing. So let me just download this. All right. I'm not going to insult you by reading every word. I'm assuming that you've already read this. That might be a bad assumption. But if you haven't read this, go back and, and read this. Whatever you do for this project, I want it to be purposeful. All right? This project, you're going to demonstrate that you know how to do the most important things that we talk about in this class. So, to create a web page that has a form that allows you to add something to a database. That's one of the most important things of this class. So, you have to be able to create the form, validate the form, insert into the database. That's one of the most important things in the class. So you have to do that. But I want you to do it for something that's purposeful. I don't just simply want a page that adds to a database table just for the heck of it without any real purpose behind it. It doesn't have to be something that is gigantic, but whatever you take on, I want you to solve that problem completely. All right. So, whatever it is that you do, I want you to create something that actually solves some sort of problem or serves some kind of purpose. Let me give you a for instance. All right. Someone did a fantasy basketball comparison where you could you could have statistics about two basketball teams and compare them side by side. It wasn't really a fantasy basketball so much as a comparison application. So you could pull up by position. So you could, you could say, I want to see the centers for both teams. And both teams' centers would appear, and it would show you the statistics for them. I want to see the starting lineups for both teams, and it would put them side by side so that you could compare the statistics for, for that. All right? It wasn't like a whole giant statistical analysis package, but for what the purpose of it was, it did it. The purpose of it was to allow someone to compare two basketball teams and to see side by side the statistics for them and so that you can make the comparison, so you can see who you think is going to win. All right? Had a very small purpose, but it solved that purpose completely. All right? Or nearly completely. People have done online polls, all right, whereas you put in a question and you put in a list of responses and people can vote on uh, the responses, you know, what house of Harry Potter do you think you belong with? Gryffindor, Slytherin, Hufflepuff, and Ravenclaw. I got them all right. I'm amazed. Yeah. <laughs> I always yeah. I always forget Ravenclaw, but that one that one came on. All right. So you could, you know, and you I'm sure you've all seen these kind of silly things online where they do that and they show like, you know, percentages or, you know, who do you think will win the World Series? And you list a list of four teams and you can pick among those and it will show the results and all that. Again, doesn't have to be an all-purpose polling application. But for whatever it does to allow users to look at polls and select who they think is going to win, all right, it does that job completely. So I'd rather see you take on a small task but do a super job satisfying the requirements for that task than try to do something like really crazy big and only do portions of it. Now, this requires a little bit of discussion sometimes, because a lot of times people will often, you know, come up with an idea that is really big. So I'll try to work with you to narrow it, to say, okay, 
Um, you can't implement a complete uh, uh, product ordering system like Amazon, but maybe you can do a search for through a catalog or something like that, where we take one aspect of something that you want to do and focus just on that. All right. So it's going to take a little juggling. That's why it's a good idea for you to start thinking about what you want to do now so that you can talk to me if you have any questions and we can work on either narrowing it down or expanding it so it's about the right size. All right. So that's, that's really, like, important. Um, it's also important to start early. And the one thing that I hear every semester is I hear students, I just can't think of anything to do. It's like, okay, I can appreciate that, you know, just pick something. Just, just, you know, talk to me and we can work together to pick something. It's not, it shouldn't be agonized over, all right? Um, it should be that you pick it, we maybe spend a few minutes refining it, and then you run with it. As opposed to spinning your wheels for weeks, not getting any progress done because you can't think of the absolute perfect project idea to do. All right? Now, your project will be done in two parts, and I'm not sure if these point numbers are correct. Uh, look at the syllabus for the corrected point numbers, because I have a feeling I changed them. But there are still two parts to this. There's a design, and there is the finished product. The finished product, of course, is everything needed to run your application, the database, the web pages, the CSS files, the code that you have, all that together like you would turn in for an assignment. So you'll zip up your application folder and you'll turn that in. That is the final project that you'll turn in. But prior to that is the design phase. And the design phase is not to be skipped over. All right? Um, there's a famous graph in computer science that looks like this. Or I'm paying. <laughs> oh, this doesn't have pain. This graph will be true. 
It's sort of like the difference between changing the layout of your house while it's still plans that, you, that the architect is sketching out on a paper uh, before you actually build the house as compared to actually when you're living in the house, right? If you're living in the house, there's all kinds of costs. You have to knock down walls if you want to uh, expand a room. And it's an inconvenience to your family. And maybe you have to go out to eat because there's a hole in your kitchen wall or something like that, right? Whereas if it's just the plans on a sheet of paper, it's relatively easy and inexpensive to make that change at that point in time. All right? So we try through our good programming practices to flatten this out a little bit, but we'll never make it completely flat. So what does this mean? This means that your planning step of the project is critical. So spend a lot of time planning your project. Spend a lot of time designing your project to know what it is that you want to do so that hopefully by the time you reach the later stages, you don't have to make a lot of changes. All right? Because changes then are very expensive. So, you will design this. Your design will consist of the following. And you can do it similar to the design that you did in CISS 216 if you had me, if that's useful to you. I noticed a couple students last semester in this class did that, and that was great. Here's the thing specifically I'm looking for, though. A few paragraphs that talk about the, the purpose of your application, including a description of what goals your site will address for the user. All right. Remember, you're building a site to solve a problem. What are your goals for um, your user? What do you want your user to be able to do? All right. Second thing is an entity relationship diagram. diagram. That is critical. All right. We will talk about entity relationship diagrams when we start getting into databases. Consider the database to be the foundation of an application. If the database design is solid, then the application can be solid. And by solid, I mean it can be changed without crumbling down. All right? It's robust. It can, you, can, you can make changes to it, and it won't uh, cause massive problems. That can happen if your database design is sound. If your database design is not sound, all right, then any change that you make could cause um, massive ripples throughout the system, and you get into a situation like this where the cost becomes really, really, really expensive to make a change. That's worth a substantial amount of the points. I want a listing then of what pages you're going to create for your site. You have certain requirements that you have to do on this site, and they're listed here. You have to tell me what pages are going to, what pages you're going to have that include those requirements. We'll look at those requirements in a second. All right. Finally, you're going to have a prototype of the application's homepage and two other pages. The prototype can be mocked up in Word. It can be created as a graphic, done as HTML, or done in ASP.NET. What is the purpose of a prototype, remember? is to give uh, people reviewing the site an idea of what the site's going to look like and how you're going to navigate it so that they can give feedback. All right. The completed application should include a site map page, include four other pages, each with, which interact with the database. Now, if you have, 
you know, it's possible to have pages that don't interact with the database. So you can have as many of those as you want. Those don't count to your four total pages. So you need four pages which interact with the databases, the database in some way. It could read from the database. It could insert stuff in the database. It could update stuff. It could delete stuff. All right? But you need four of them. And you need to do the following oper uh, ap uh, operations within your application. You need to do a query based on some criteria. So, for example, search based on basketball team. Show me the roster for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Show me the roster for the Golden State Warriors. Show me all the forwards in the NBA. Show me all the centers in the NBA. That's doing a query based on some criteria. For polls, show me all the polls that are related to Harry Potter. All right? Show me all the polls that are related to Star Wars and so on. That's what I mean by a query based on some criteria. Well, we're not simply seeing everything in the database. It's pretty rare that you ever want to see everything on a database. You're not going to Amazon and say, show me every product that you sell. You're going to Amazon and searching for something specific. Show me all the Stephen King books that you have. Show me all, well, that would be just about as much as, as all the products in Amazon, right? <laughs> so that was a bad example. Uh, show me all the records by the Beatles. Show me all uh, of the videos that, uh, you know, uh, Brad Pitt was in. Show me all of this. Show me all of that. So you have some criteria to do your search. All right? And that's all I mean by do a query based on some criteria. So you're, you're looking up information in the database, but not showing everything in the database. You're looking for certain, uh, matching certain criteria. You need to be able to do inserts, updates, and deletes. So you need to add to the database, change the database, and delete things from the database. And finally, you need to show header and detailed data. Some of these things are liable to be more clear when we talk more about databases, but header detailed data is where essentially you have a one-to-many relationship in a database. So, for example, the header could be information about a basketball team, Cleveland Cavaliers. Here's their coach. Here's where they play. Here's what their logo looks like. Um, here is, um, I, I don't know, their, their email address. The detail would be the multiple things associated with the Cleveland Cavaliers, such as a list of all the players. So there'd be one team and 12 players listed. That would be an example of a header detail. Uh, with a movie, you might have information about the movie, then all the actors that are in the movie. Uh, for a poll, you might have the poll uh, that you're, the question you're asking, and all of the possible answers that, uh, that, the, that people are allowed to give for that poll. That's what I mean by a header detail, where you're showing one thing and a bunch of things related to that one thing. So those are things that you need to do. Those can be anywhere on these four pages, right? So you need four pages that interact with the database, and here's the different ways that you need to interact with the database. Your website should look professional, employ good coding practices, be accessible and cross-browser compatible. Should be user-friendly, fully functional, and fulfill the stated purpose. The site doesn't need to be extensive, but whatever it does, it should do it completely. Let me give you a for instance for this. All right. Going back to the compare to basketball teams. There may be no way within the application to add a new basketball team to the list in case the NBA expands and there's now uh, a team in St. Louis or something. All right. There's no, there might be no way in the application to do that, but that's okay. Because that's, the application doesn't need to do everything that you possibly ever would want to do. All right? If it fulfills its purpose otherwise, if it allows you to, to look at two teams and do a comparison of them. All right? 
So don't think that your, that, that your application has to do every possible thing that could ever do. It's okay to say, well, my application doesn't allow you to add teams to the list of teams. If you want to add a new team, you have to go through the database to do that. That's fine, all right? But whatever purpose you have set out to do, you should be able to do that by, uh, via your application. So, for example, if your purpose is to compare two teams, you should be able to compare two teams. All right? And it should do that completely. Again, think of small functionality that you're going to do well as opposed to doing, uh, thinking of a lot of big functionality that you're only going to uh, scratch the surface on. So think in a very focused way, something that's going to solve an actual problem, if you will, or satisfy a goal or serve a need. Any questions? All right, we only have about eight minutes left, so I'm going to do the rarest of rare things and call it a day. We'll see you in lab. Um, I, um, I will go unlock the lab, then I will be back eventually. Um, we'll see you then. Uh, on uh, Thursday, we will talk about master pages.